Hello and welcome to the Club Assistant Referee Support Workshop, uh, which is a pre-recorded training video for clubs within Cambridgeshire FA. The aims of uh, this development session um, are to provide guidance for club assistant referees, both new and existing, um, on how they can assist all levels of grassroots game um, matches and match officials um, to provide the best possible experience for all of those involved. This will be put together due to changes in the Cambridgeshire Kershaw County link um, with changes to the assistance or appointments of assistant referees on the Premier Division, uh, but is also appropriate for all other grassroots uh, football within the county, including the Colts League and the Women's and Girls League, um, as well as Sunday League and the Friendly League. If you have any questions um, at the conclusion of this video, then please do drop us an email into referees at cambridgeshirefa.com where we will be able to provide further guidance and support for you. We're going to look at a number of factors uh, today and a number of items that can help you uh, become a uh, fully supportive system referee and to provide the best experience for all of those involved in the game. We're going to start by looking at what expectations um, are for a club system referee. Uh, the, the main one really that we're going to start off looking at revolves around the safeguarding aspects and, and the age of club assistant referees. Uh, due to safeguarding, um, the assistant referee must be over the age of 16 years old within adult football, um, follow the same guidelines as uh, player and coach involvement in adult football, uh, all being over the age of 16. In youth football, uh, th th this is best practice, um, and we recommend that all of those individuals um, that act as a club assistant referee are over the age of 16 years old. Due to the current climate that, that we find ourselves in, one of the, the, the discussions that's been had between the county FA and uh, affiliated leagues is around the use of club system referees. Um, historically, we may have seen that this would have been either a manager or players, um, where it's changing perhaps two or three times a game. Because of what is going on um, at the moment with COVID-19, this is no longer practical um, due to the need to sanitise equipment um, whenever it is changing hands. Um, as such, we now need to find an individual that can complete the full 90 minutes of the game um, as an assistant referee. So that does put an extra demand on volunteers. We, we do appreciate that. But if we are changing assistant referees numerous times during the game, the, the delays of that causes um, due to the need to sanitise the equipment uh, is, is far greater than uh, we would like. We recommend that a manager of the play does not take part, particularly a manager, um, based on the fact that as soon as you pick up that flag and become an assistant referee, uh, you're no longer allowed to, to provide any, any coaching or any support to that team because you are part of the, the match officials team uh, for the period of the game. This ruling is there to protect the integrity of the game. Obviously, if you are acting as an assistant referee, you've got a greater um, positional benefits by moving up and down with the, with the defensive line um, and you provide coaching that can benefit the defensive line from that um, on a more consistent and um, unfair basis. So the role of an assistant referee should purely be acting as a system referee um, and shouldn't be used as a coaching exercise as well um, and using a joint role there to do so. This is why we're looking now for an individual that would be um, used for the full 90 minutes that is not involved in either coaching or play. But ideally, we're looking also for an individual that can maintain that role uh, throughout the season. Uh, worst case scenario, uh, two or three individuals rotating around different games, staying for the full 90 minutes of those games would also work. Um, in terms of managing that equipment transition, we would recommend that each of those individuals has their own flag uh, to avoid sort of any more delays in terms of sanitisation that may need to take place. Uh, it's something less for you to worry about if you know those three individuals are available um, on a rotor basis system. Um, you've not then got to provide the equipment for each of them on match day sanitizer. It's one less thing to, to, to worry about um, and one less thing that you, you could potentially forget about. One of the expectations we have is that assistant referees are fit and mobile and able to keep up with play. As a assistant referee, you're not going to be static throughout the game. You're going to be moving continuously um, as the defensive line moves. So you need to be able to keep up with play for the full 90 minutes uh, in order to provide uh, quality support to the match official um, through uh, correct judgments based on the position of that back line. 
In terms of our positioning, uh, the referee will direct you towards uh, the left back position on the touchline for the majority of cases. There may be some uh, officials that have been officiating for a long time and still work off the old uh, right back position uh, on the touchline. Um, it's recommended that referees work off of a, an assistant referee on in the left back position. So, 99% of the time you will you will be in that position um, on the touchline. And you will always follow that second rearmost defender up and down the pitch as those as play moves and develops and grows. Um, that will enable you to be in the correct judgment position for offside infringements, which we'll touch upon in a little bit more detail later on, as this is quite a, a complex um, situation for you to deal with, um, and we want to give you the adequate information there to support as best as you can. One thing you are there for is to support the referee in certain decisions. These include ball and out play, such as goal kicks, corners and throw-ins, offsides, as, we, as we've touched upon, and identifying um, when substitutes may need to take place um, or identifying when clubs wish to make substitutes. This can help the referee in their alertness of what is going on around the play and can help speed up the process of those substitutions and get the game back underway as quickly as possible. Before the game, there's a few key areas that we need to take into consideration as well. Uh, we need to ensure we are wearing appropriate clothing based on sort of the conditions that are around there. What we recommend is a pair of football boots, neutral clothing, ideally black, to help the referee distinguish you from any other individuals that are um, there, such as substitutes, management staff. Um, obviously, a flag is a good identifying tool, but uh, clothing can make it even easier for um, the referee to quickly spot you for when something needs to take place. We recommend that you meet, meet the referee before the game to discuss how you can best support that referee. Each referee will have their own little individual um, bits that they want you to do, as well as this guidance that we, we, we touch upon. Um, so it's always best to have that chat with the referee in order to build that rapport with the individual you're going to be working with for the, for the duration of the game. It also allows them to advise you what they fully expect during the game as well. One change this year is that clubs will now supply um, a good flag rather than the match official uh, due to COVID-19. Um, this is because it helps limit the number of uh, transitions that would take place with, with the flag previously. We're going from referee to club, club to assistant and back again. Okay, it's that one less supply chain. And as mentioned before, ideally you would have your own flag um, which the club have provided previously and has been properly sanitised on transition that you can keep for the duration of the season um, for as long as you are performing that role um, to limit that, that change over on match day and make it even easier um, and one less thing to worry about. During the game, there's a few do's and don'ts that I'm just going to recap briefly what we've just touched upon, uh, but also highlight some extra areas that we, we haven't yet touched upon. So do's, we're going to identify when the ball has, has crossed the line um, and gone in and out of play. When we're doing so, we need to ensure the whole of the ball has crossed the line, not just part of the ball or half the ball. All of the ball needs to cross all of the line in order to be deemed out of play. Okay. We're going to identify offside infringements or offences, and we're going to stay in line with the second last defender. At the taking to throw ins, the referee may ask us to monitor the, the feet of the throw in taker during the throw in. And when doing so, we want to ensure that part of both feet are either touching the floor. Um, either on the touchline or behind. When taking that into consideration, we need to consider the heel of each foot can be on the inside edge of the line on the pitch with the majority of the foot actually on the pitch. Uh, if the heel of the foot is on the line, that is a legitimate throwing uh, taking uh, method. Some some things not to, that, we, that we don't recommend doing. Um, referee is a sole timekeeper. So as a club assistant referee, there's no practical need for you to keep check at a time. Um, if there's any discussions around timekeeping or the length of time played in terms of stoppage time, that is solely at the referee's own discretion um, based on what they have um, calculated during the game due to injuries and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. That's not something that you need to, to be considering. Um, if, if managers ask you how long's left, just give a, a practical example if you are um, keeping track so say if there's 10 minutes left plus injury just say 10 minutes plus injury um, and the referee can advise them what the what the injury time is um, when when it gets to that stage 
One thing we don't recommend as well is that you do not flag for free kicks or penalty kicks. Uh, this is to enable the referee to be consistent throughout the game on both sides of the pitch um, and ensures the, the, the fairness um, of that decision-making process um, is, is the same for both teams. Okay. We're going to move on to signals now and look at the signals that an assistant referee um, will use throughout the game to help you increase your knowledge and to enable the referee to identify easily and quickly what decision you are giving. So, cock kick signal uh, with a flag is straight out in front of you, okay, at shoulders height pointing across the pitch. Corner kick, you're going to point down towards the corner flag, okay. It's one of those where the ball on both of those has gone in and out of play first, so it's quite a tight in and out decision. You might want to raise your flag in the air first and then identify those two goal kick or corner kick signals. Throwing, you're going to point in the direction that the attacking team is kicking to identify that it is an attacking throwing. And vice versa, if it's a defensive throwing, you're going to kick in, you're going to point in the direction the defensive team is kicking. Similarly, again, if the ball's gone in and out of play, you may want to raise your flag in the air so the referee can identify the ball has in fact gone out of play and then lower it into those two positions there to identify the direction of the throwing. With offside, there's two actions that take place on all occasions every time you identify the offside. So your first action is going to be pointing the flag directly into the air. And secondly, you're going to be pointing towards once the referee has acknowledged you via the whistle and stop play. You're going to adjust your flag and position it and point it towards the location of where the infringement took place. So you put your near side, your middle, where you're going to go up first and then point across the middle. And then you've got your far side, and then you're going to point in the air and go over to the far side. Practically, what that means is if you look at the field of play, your near side is going to be that third in front of you there that, that stretches, depending on the width of the pitch, from the touch line to the edge of the six yard box. Your near side, or your middle side, sorry, is going to be the diameter or the width of the six yard box and the centre circle, depending on the width of the pitch. And you're going to go up and across. And your far side is going to be up in the air and points across that final third. That helps the referee identify where the free kick needs to take place. And you're going to hold that position there until the kicker has placed the ball down so they can easily identify where the free kick also needs to take place as well. So we're going to look at now when do we penalise a player who is in an offside position. So a player who is in an offside position, if they're in the opponent's half and the ball is played and they are closer to the goal line than the second last defender. So that's the first criteria that we need to take into consideration of both of those boxes in our minds need to be ticked when we're considering whether an infringement has take, taken place. We would then penalise them as well if they interfere with play. So by doing so, they are playing or touching the ball that has been passed to a teammate or preventing the player, an opponent from playing the ball or restricting their line of vision, whether they're challenging for the ball or not. Or whether they're clearly attempting to play the ball or making obvious actions, which impacts an opponent's sort of ability to play the ball as well. We're also going to consider whether they are gaining an advantage with this as well by playing the ball or interfering with an opponent. It has rebound off the post crossbar match official or an opponent has been deliberately saved by an opponent as well. Okay, so there's those two actions to take into consideration there. We're not going to penalise an offside, however, if they are within their own half when the ball is played, if they are behind the ball when it is played, whether they receive the ball directly from the opponent that has deliberately played the ball, or when the ball comes from a goal kick, corner, or throwing. Those situations are areas where a player cannot be judged to be offside. We're going to move on to some practical examples now and sort of try and put those words into images so that you can clearly see what that infringement looks like. So situation one here is a fairly straightforward one where the attacker player here passes the ball through to player A who is further than the second last defender which on this occasion is here but he's also passed the goalkeeper as well. On this occasion the assistant referee would raise that flag when the player touches the ball and identify that the player is in an offside position. Similarly to that however slightly different the attacker in the same position has taken a shot at goal and it's gone straight into the corner. The player here in an offside position, despite being 
further than the second last defender and further than the goalkeeper has not interfered with play and has not gained an advantage by touching the ball. And so in this occasion, the flag would remain down and we wouldn't provide an offside um, indication and the goal would be awarded. In this situation, this is one where it can get a little bit complex sometimes. It can be a case of waiting and seeing to see what happens. Waiting and seeing as to which player is going to engage with the ball and collect the ball and, and touch the ball. In this situation here, you've got the attacker playing a through ball, which could be collected by player B or by player A. On this occasion, player A is in an offside defence, is in an offside position, sorry, and makes movements towards the ball. However, at the same time as player A moving towards the ball, player B, who is in an onside position, also moves towards the ball, but collects the ball before player A does. As player A did not touch the ball, there can be penalised for being offside, and play would continue. In this situation, the attacker feeds the ball through to player A, who is in an offside position, and the offside would be awarded, as no other teammate in an onside position has the opportunity to play the ball. This player here is in a far greater distance away. If that player was to move in and player A was to stand still, then that would change that decision and we would link back into the previous example. Option number five is the attacker attempts to play the through ball to a player in the offside position, but it goes out to play for a goal kick on this occasion, or it could go out for a throw-in or, or a different decision. Because player A here in this position runs towards the ball but does not make contact with the ball, we would award a goal kick there because they haven't gained an advantage. This situation here, the attacker in the middle of the pitch takes a shot at goal. Player A here is interfering with, with the opponent by blocking the goalkeeper's line of view. As such, he is clearly obstructing play and interfering with play. And without that player being there, that goalkeeper has a better attempt at saving the ball. In this occasion, we would ward an offside and we would raise our flag accordingly with that. A similar situation here. However, player A is not interfering with play as he is not blocking the goalkeeper's line of view. As such, we would not um, indicate for an offside offence has taken place. So we would allow play to continue and keep our flag down. Situation here, we're now looking at gaining an advantage process. So player A has taken a shot at goal and the keeper has saved it. And the ball has ricocheted to play a big from that save. Because the player was in an offside position when the shot took place on this example, we would indicate that the player B was in an offside position and raise our flag and award an offside offence. This situation is a little bit different, but follows the same guidelines. Player A takes a shot, but a defender on the goal line saves the ball legitimately with their feet, body or head. And it ricochets to player B, who is also in an offside position, because he is greater than the second last defender, which on this occasion is the goalkeeper. So this is where that crossover situation happens, and we need to now be aware that the goalkeeper is the second last defender. Okay, When that shot comes in, player B is ahead of that goalkeeper, and we would award an offside offence on that occasion. On this situation, player A, plays the ball to B, who makes a run into the penalty area and cuts it back for player C, who, despite being further than the second last defender, is behind the ball when the ball is played. Because player C is behind the ball when the ball is played, we would not award an offside offence and we would allow a play to continue. If, on that example, player C was ahead of the ball, then we would, of course, award an offside offence. There are more examples of that available on the IFAB website, which will allow you to go through um, more. There are also some really uh, good videos on YouTube that can go into some, some greater detail should you wish to. However, those guidelines there that we've just been through and those that are practical advice should give you enough of a basic knowledge to be able to perform your task with confidence, knowing that you are clear on how offside works. Okay. 
we're going to look at some some frequently asked questions now to to finish off the presentation um, in order to help answer any questions that you may have following that um, guidance. So first one, what do I do if the referee misses my flag? Uh, if the referee does miss your flag um, initially, keep your flag in the air until the referee does acknowledge you. This is important when we're potentially looking at offside infringement. So we, we're trying to get the referee's attention to advise them that an offside has taken place. The last thing you want to do is to drop your flag as the referee looks over because of player calls and you've got your flag lowered uh, on an offside offence because if you later then put up your flag, the referee is going to be in doubt as to what's happened. You're much better to keep your flag in the air until the referee acknowledges you. The ball then enters the back of the net and you've still got your flag in the air. The referee will then likely come over and have a chat with you about what, what has happened, um, in which case then you just describe clearly um, the processes that have taken place so that the referee can, can come to that conclusion that uh, an offside needs to be awarded. What if a referee overrules my decision? This this can take place um, and will take place at some point, I'm sure, during the season with you. Um, remember, you're there as an assistant referee rather than an insistent referee. Um, it is likely that the referee has, in their opinion, a better angle of the decision and they're seeing it differently to yourself. It's important that you are not offended when this takes place um, as they have generally probably just seen it slightly differently and might have a better angle. Most referees will acknowledge um, and explain what has happened to you very quickly um, as not to uh, delay play. Just remember, please don't get offended. The hardest decisions um, and when this normally takes place are on those hard decisions when a ricochet happens right under your nose. Um, being on top of play doesn't give you the angle to clearly see what has happened and can, they can be, probably will be the hardest decisions that you will have to make. This one refers to offsides and we're looking at how can I watch a player kicking the ball and also the position of the players in the forward line at the same time. So these can be quite difficult, but with most offsides decisions you give, they will likely be in your peripheral vision. So the kicker and the player in an offside position will be within your field of view. So we'll be able to see both occurrences that do happen at the same time. You can use audio cues for when the ball is kicked, which is a good telltale sign for those ones where the long balls come over the top and you can't see both, both situations happening at the same time. Just remember, don't raise your flag too quickly. Wait and see which player, which player collects the ball and to ensure that it's gone to a player in an offside position. Think back to the example where the through ball came through to a player A who was on an offside position on the right-hand side of the pitch. The player B from an onside position came through and collected the ball in that situation with player on because player A hasn't infringed. That situation can happen on a match day, so we'd much rather see a late flag that gets correct, that is given correctly, rather than a, a quick flag where a player then comes through um, and collects the ball and we, we end up indicating incorrectly. What should I do if the ball goes out of play, uh, but I don't know which team touched it last? So in this instance, you'd raise your flag straight in the air like you would with the first phase of um, identifying offside uh, to let the referee know the ball has gone out of play. At this stage, just drop your flag when the referee has acknowledged you um, and the referee will then be able to tell that you are unsure which way uh, the throwing goal kick or corner needs to go um, and allow the referee to make that decision. Uh, what happens if I get injured? Um, if you are fortunate enough to get injured during the game, try and get the referee's attention to advise that you can no longer continue. Um, the easiest way to do this is to either put your flag in the air um, or to sit on the floor, uh, depending on the weather conditions. Um, and use players around you to help get the referee's attention. If you do get injured and the replacement comes, please remember to sanitise the flag correctly um, so that it's nice and clean for the new uh, assistant referee and there's no risk of uh, transmission um, of any potential COVID-19 cases. What if we don't have an assistant referee? Um, if you're unable to provide an AR, um, if you agree the referee may ask your opponent, opponents to provide one um, in replacement. If you don't agree to this or this is not possible, um, the referee will try and manage those offside situations by themselves. Although, please remember that they won't be in a position to accurately tell whether a player is in an offside defence when the ball has been kicked due to their location on the field of play. But they will do the best job they can do. It is to your advantage to have an assistant referee as it ensures that those decisions are more accurate than they potentially will be uh, with a referee managing that situation by themselves. Uh, what should I do if I get abuse from spectators or players? Um, the ball goes, when the ball goes out of play, raise your flag in the air to alert the referee. 
um, and advise the referee calmly about what has happened and allow them to take appropriate action that they feel necessary. If you feel you cannot continue following this, um, please advise the referee and allow them to find a suitable re replacement. One thing to take into consideration as well that, that we haven't sort of mentioned within the, the slide deck is that following the guidelines of COVID-19 ahead of the restart of football, um, please ensure that you are fit and proper um, in order to complete the task, that you don't have any symptoms of COVID-19 prior to arrival at the ground. And if you feel in at any stage or if, if you start to feel symptoms whilst at the ground, please let the referee know um, and, and leave the area um, as soon as possible and find the replacement assistant and referee with the referee's help. Um, at that stage, sanitise the equipment uh, appropriately for that new individual to take over. That concludes the end of the support session. Um, all the best for the new season. And if you do have any questions from this, this quick session, uh, please email referees at cambridgeshirefa.com where we'll happily provide any further guidance that you may need. Thank you.